So, on June 20th, 1974, the Los Angeles Sentinel ran a brief article announcing that a new film was being made in Los Angeles. The article began, quote, Larry Clark, 29, Director, writer, cinematographer, film editor, still photographer, and currently developing film workshop classes at the Performing Arts Society of Los Angeles has started production on a feature-length drama passing through. If we add Painter to the Sentinel's descriptive list of Clark's artistic practice and community engagement, we have an even fuller picture of the many facets of his career that we'll be celebrating and exploring over the course of this three-day series devoted to Clark's films, those he's directed and those he's contributed to, beginning with Tonight, the incomparable masterpiece, Passing Through. We would be thrilled to be screening these films under any circumstances, but we are especially honored to be doing so this weekend with Larry Clark here in person at The Wilder. So I want to just welcome Larry to the theater. It's a real honor to have him back, and all of the screenings in this series will be followed by a Q&A with Larry. We are grateful to him for making the time to be with us, and I want to encourage you all to come back tomorrow night and Sunday to see the films and engage with him afterwards. As you enter the theater here, you may have seen on screen a selection of Clark's paintings and photographs, which we'll be highlighting each night as part of our pre-show presentation. As you walk through the lobby, we hope you also stop to explore materials on display from the recently processed Larry Clark papers that illuminate passing through and its international exhibition history. Larry deposited his paper archives with UCLA, and the, and the work of preparing the collection was conducted through the Center of Primary Research and Training at the UCLA Library Special Collections, a program that pairs graduate students with a variety of academic disciplines with archival projects that match their interests and expertise. CFPRT scholar Maggie Tarmi has an extensive background in film studies and is a current MLIS student at UCLA focusing on archival studies and moving image archival practices. He spent the summer processing and describing the Larry Clark papers and developed outreach efforts to support discovery and access to this critical collection. I'd like to ask Maggie to come up now and share a little bit about the collection and the work that has gone into making it available for researchers. Maggie, do you want to come on up? Hi, everyone, and good evening and welcome. Uh, again, I am Maggie. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. And for the last few months, I've been processing the Larry Clark papers. And it has just been such an honor to work with Larry Clark's materials, and it's been a really tremendous learning experience. I hope some of you were able to pick up a copy of the booklets that I've prepared. They'll also be available after tonight's show and probably the rest of the weekend, unless we run out. And uh, I hope you'll be able to take a sneak peek into this collection, because it's just incredible. This collection focuses primarily on materials surrounding tonight's showing of Passing Through, including beautifully printed posters, brochures, and press clippings, from the film's decades of touring the International Film Festival circuit following its release in 1977. Passing Through has been referred to as one of the greatest jazz films of all time. Music, particularly jazz, is a medium that truly crosses all geographic, language, and cultural boundaries. After spending the summer working with this collection of passing through materials, it became clear that this masterpiece, like great jazz, has transcended all of these differences to profoundly move audiences from all backgrounds and all walks of life. Positive press has followed the film around the globe to places like Somalia, Cuba, the USSR, India, and Burkina Faso. This collection is so important as a look into the radical black filmmaking of Africa during the late 1970s and into the 1980s. Not only did Larry Clark make phenomenal films, but he also made a difference in filmmaking as an art form. There are portions of this collection that include materials on Larry Clark assisting the creation of the first ever film school in Burkina Faso. There's also materials that discuss the state of African filmmaking, including records of how different African nations were working collaboratively to create their own national filmmaking traditions independent of the major Hollywood and European systems. These writings are incredible, and they're unlike anything I've ever seen or learned about before. They hold extraordinary research value, and I'm proud to share that they're all now available for viewing by the public and research at UCLA Library Special Collections. Passing through in its impact and its reach cannot go forgotten, nor can Larry Clark's hard work in supporting the development of African and Black diaspora filmmaking. And I'm so thrilled that this valuable slice of film history is now available for public access and research use. With that, I'd like everyone to give a warm welcome to the incredible Larry Clark.
Thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people here tonight in a theater uh, uh, after years of seclusion. Um, Passing Through was made to be seen in a theater context, not on VHS or DVD or online. And that's how I wanted the film to be shown. Um, and um, I'm so happy to see so many people here uh, tonight to look at the film. I'm not going to say much. Uh, we'll talk afterwards about the uh, film and the making of the film and other issues. Um, so I'm going to be short. <laughs> Larry Clark is a filmmaker and professor of film at San Francisco State University. Born in Ohio, he attended Miami University in Oxford, where he, quote, raised a lot of hell as the president of the Black Student Union. In 1970, he drove his Volkswagen bug across Route 66 to Los Angeles, where he enrolled in film school at UCLA. There, he became a central member of a group of innovative black filmmakers, including Charles Burnett, Haile Garima, and Julie Dash, who came to be known collectively as the L.A. Rebellion. Clark's uncle was renowned jazz pianist Sonny Clark. His father, who worked as a mailman, played sax and taught Latin dance, and his mother, who was a housekeeper, sang opera. So it's fitting that his first feature, Passing Through, is often cited as one of the best jazz films ever made. In addition to Passing Through, uh, Larry, uh, direct, Larry Clark directed the 1974 long-form short film, uh, As Above, So Below, about the political awakening of a black army veteran playing tomorrow night followed on Sunday by Clark's second feature, Cutting Horse from 2002, a modern day Western about the ambitious dreams of a struggling African American and Mexican American horse trainers. Clark has received numerous awards, including the Oscar Micheaux Award for Cinematography. He travels the world exclusively, or extensively, often at the invitation of major festivals and retrospectives. It's my great honor to welcome to the stage, Larry Clark. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a really pleasure to have you here. Well, so, thank, thank you. So I wanted to start um, at the beginning. Um, you've said in the past that Passing Through was not a film that was made and brought to the community. It was rather a film made in the black community by the black community. And that kind of engaged production practice was sort of something that really set apart the films of the LA Rebellion filmmakers, partly of necessity, but more importantly, uh, as a matter of political principle, the idea of you were bringing media production practices out of the school into the communities to transform both. Can you talk a little bit about the origins of the film and how, how everybody came together or how you brought everybody together to make it in, those context, in that context? Uh, well, um, when I was first admitted to uh, uh, UCLA in the film department, I promised myself that I would have one film at UCLA, one foot at UCLA, and the other foot in the, in the community, mm -hmm. uh, because the the subject matter was going to be uh, such that um, I really needed community support. I couldn't rely solely on film students uh, for crew and all of that, although they were willing. But they all had their own projects, their own work, so there was a limited amount of time that people could actually afford to uh, use on someone else's film. So I set up a film workshop at the Performing Arts Society of Los Angeles, which was on 87th and uh, Vermont. And the person who was the artistic director of, uh, we called it Pazilus for short, uh, was Van Tau Whitfield. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to the Performing Arts Society uh, to propose this uh, project, this film workshop, uh, I'd never met Van before, but I he listened patiently. And then when I got to the end of my spiel about how I wanted to do this film workshop in the community, he said, well, listen, he said, uh, I was a student, film student at UCLA, and he, he told me the year, and he was one of the first uh, African Americans to graduate from the film department. This was years and years ago. So he understood what my struggles were going to be. So he said I could set up this film workshop. And mo a lot of the actors and and in my films came from the workshop, uh, Nathaniel Taylor and, uh, and, and many of them. And uh, so he understood clearly uh, what I was trying to do. And he said also that he would uh, uh, give some money for films, which I thought was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I set up the film workshop and um, 
a lot of uh, young people came through the workshop that uh, wanted to make films and didn't necessarily want to work in Hollywood or go to film school, but they were interested in film. And so there was one person in particular that was really talented. That was Roderick Young. He did this film and also, along with George Geddes and uh, as above, so below. So the, 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 the community was just, it was a no brainer. You know, it was, it, it, it was, uh, um, so I, you know, I would learn something at UCLA and then take UCLA's equipment down to 87 Vermont and <laughs> without them knowing it <laughs> and, and teach people there, you know, and the, the best people kind of rose to the top. People who were serious stayed around people who weren't, you know, they sort of went their own way. So I had a, a complete crew at, at Paslo. It was a very good crew. I mean, it was these they were really good, good, good craftsmen, good crew. And um, and also had the actors um, that were in the uh, um, in the theater and some of the people in this film they kind of got their start like for example Marley Gibbs who was uh, the, the Jeffersons this was her first time on film so that little short thing you know and Nathaniel Taylor had appeared in a couple things but as minor roles when I saw him uh, I knew he was the actor but I mean he wasn't even on stage he was on a ladder putting up lights and I, and I just saw this guy come down the ladder and he was like a cat you know I said this is a guy I need for my films you know and uh, um, so uh, yeah so the, the community was you know uh, 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 for example I, I needed a restaurant and uh, I went to talk to, I saw a restaurant that I really liked I talked to the owner never saw her before in my life she didn't know who I was I mentioned that I was at UCLA uh, working on my master's degree, mm -hmm. and she was of that generation of, of, of uh, African Americans that came up to, from the mig Great Migration, and the the mantra then was get your education. Mm -hmm. I remember growing up hearing that all the time with the old folks, my grandfather, my grandmother, um, uh, all the old folks, they get your education. That was, you hear that almost every day. And so, because I was a student at UCLA, she said, look, I could use the restaurant. I think it was on a Saturday or Sunday when they were closed, and um, she said, I'll give you the keys. And we, and so we got there, and she had set out a couple apple pie, uh, cherry pies for us, you know. And I told the crew, I said, look, we got to leave this place better than we found it, <laughs> you know, uh, at which we did, you know. And, and, and another time I needed an uh, iron rod bed, and I went to a thrift store, and um, I mentioned that I was a student at UCLA in the film department, and, and, the, and the woman said, oh, I didn't have to buy, it's just, I could take it, and when I finished with it, I could bring it back. So it was like the community really participated in all kinds of ways, and not only acting and the music, uh, uh, props, you know. Right. Uh, and we that was consistent with my films and with some of the other films, you know, that Charles Burnett, for example, he organized his block. <laughs> it was like the Seven Samurai, you know. <laughs> he organized his block to go to war, you know. Yeah. And so the kids were all from his block. The actors were from his block. And so that's kind of like the way we uh, found it necessary to make films. And it worked out for us because, uh, you know, it was, yeah, it, it was a, a, a film by the community, you know. We, and they took ownership of it, too. Right. Mm -hmm. One of your key collaborators in Passing Through, but also as Above, So Below, is comp composer and jazz artist Horace Tapscott. Um, he was also very focused on um, mentorship and, and, and engaging. You've described him as a, in an interview once as a Papa Harris-like figure. Can, mm -hmm. can you talk about when, how you first met um, Horace and, and his impact on yeah. you? Yeah, well, uh, I just finished uh, As Above, So Below, and I needed some music. And so um, there was a, a guy in the community. I didn't know him very well. He was a friend of a friend. And he wanted, he was curious. He wanted to see what I was doing. So I invited him out to the, I don't know why I invited him out, you know, but I did, you know. Funny how things happen, you know, just say, oh, yeah, come on out and I'll show you uh, what I'm doing. And uh, I had just completed the film, but I didn't have music. And so the person that was supposed to score it came out. And uh, at the end of the film, the person who was going to score it said, "Well, uh, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to score this film with just my kazoo." <laughs> and this guy that I didn't know just went ballistic. He said, "You can't do that to our film <laughs> like right. that," you know. Right. And uh, so he said, uh, "There's somebody I want you to meet," you know, Horace Tapscott. 
So I met Horace, and we live in the same community, you know, same, not that far from each other. And so I met him, and, and how many of you know, ever been around Horace Tapscott? Raise your hands. Anybody in here? Well, he's in the a, back. We have a few in the back. Was there, was there somebody? Where? Someone raised their hand in the back. Yeah. yeah. Well, Horace is the type of guy, and you know, he just kind of talks in a matter of fact way. And so I said, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for someone to do music for my film, and do you know any people in L.A. that might be able to help? And he said, well, you know, you don't have to look out there. You can look in here in your community. There are people right here in your community that could help you with your film, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he invited me out to uh, to the uh, ARC where they were practicing. It was a church. And um, I went out, and it was all these, it was like Noah's Ark of musicians. <laughs> and I, I went out, and there was these fabulous musicians. They were all woodshedding and learning, and a lot of them, went on to be famous musicians, you know, uh, Arthur Blythe, I don't know if you know anybody, Arthur Blythe and Roberto Miranda and all of those guys. Mm -hmm. And so he was doing something similar to what I was doing, but only with music, you know, and he had been doing it for a longer period of time than mm -hmm. I had. So uh, that's how I met Horace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he did the music for As Above, So Below, and then he did uh, Passing Through. One of the things I always find so striking about passing through and as above, so below is, I mean, they're so deeply rooted in their community, the local place and space where these stories are being told, but you always have an eye on the global struggle. You always have a lot, I mean, liberation struggles in Africa, the Attica uprising, you're always connecting what's happening in the neighborhood to the, the, the larger anti-colonialist struggles, anti-racist struggles. Can, can you talk about how that, how that vision sort of came together for you? Uh, basketball. <laughs> uh, I, I I transferred my senior year from a high school here in L.A. to uh, a school called East Tech in uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And they were a basketball powerhouse. They had won state championship, city championships. They were ranked number two in the country. And I made the team. Mm -hmm. And so word spread through the, the high school that someone from Hollywood made, made the team, you know. Uh, but the coach uh, uh, was a really interesting guy. His name was Joe Howe. And I went to my first demonstration uh, with the coach. We were uh, picketing. Uh, uh, this was in 1962. We were picketing at Woolworths because there were picketing, picketing. Martin Luther King was picketing Woolworths in the South. So, uh, And so that kind of opened my up to social protest. He also taught photography, and so he implored all the basketball players to take his photography class because then he knew we would get at least one A. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the, the, the photography course, and uh, you know, I, 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 every photographer has the same story, that, that you're in the dark room and that photograph comes up and you're kind of like, it's magic and you're kind of hooked, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got involved with uh, uh, photography uh, my senior in high school, and I carried on into uh, uh, my undergraduate years at Miami University. Although I didn't major in photography, but I, um, there were I had some really good mentors and, and, and uh, interesting guys in uh, uh, at Miami University. It was a guy named Dwayne Phoenix. He was kind of like my my mentor. We used to call him Feeny Plop Plop. He was a very sickly guy. He, he was, he was really sickly. He had sickle cell anemia, but he's the coolest guy I ever met, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and uh, 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 as a fact, my roommate is back there. He knew Feeney Plop Plop. He knew Dwayne Phoenix. He was a really cool guy. And so he, he, he showed me darkroom techniques and all of that. And, and so that's how I came about. To, but I, I, I had always been doing art, you know, from the beginning. I was five years old. I was paint, I wanted to be an artist, you know. And, an artist and a cowboy or artist and a fireman or something like that, you know. And so art was always a part of my mm -hmm. uh, upbringing and my interests. I was really interested to hear in an interview you gave when you when you got accepted to the film school at UCLA, you actually, um, you were, you know, a regular still photographer and in, in, in doing that work. But when you got into the film school, you, you actually gave away your, your still photography equipment. Yeah. You actually... You said, I'm focusing still photography. I'm going to put this behind me. I'm focusing on moving images now. What was what was your thinking on, in that? Well, that was one of the stupid things that I've, I've done. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Every, Everybody got some stupid stuff that they've done. <laughs> but I, I, I was in love with photography. But when I got into film school, all of a sudden we were talking about motion picture. <laughs> Not stillies, but moving moving objects, you know. Right. And so to break away from photography, because I liked it so much, I gave away 
uh, uh, my ca- in fact, I gave my camera to Hailey's girlfriend at the time. <laughs> and uh, Hailey uh, Grima. Hailey yeah. Grima's girlfriend. Yeah, so I gave away all my still stuff because I wanted to make a, a, a complete break from still photography. Uh, I got rid of my television <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, um, um, to make a clean break from that to go forward. That's that's what I had to do, you know. Now, I, I would not recommend that, <laughs> to, to, <laughs> but that's what I had to do. Um, I have a few more questions, and we'll turn it over to the audience. So um, we have some microphones out there, so if you just raise your hands, uh, one of our ushers will bring you a mic, and, and you can ask your question. But um, I want to ask you, so going back to passing through and the structure of the film, I think we can talk about it in terms of shots and cuts and sequences and edits, but I've also heard you talk about it in terms of harmonics and accents and improvisation, and almost in the way that the film feels more um, orchestrated or conducted than directed. Can you talk a little bit about how the influence of um, you know your experience and with music has maybe impacted how you put the film together and how you yeah. structured it? A lot of it was stream of consciousness, but also Clarence Muse. Uh, from the first day I met him, he always referred to the script as uh, 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 my opera. <laughs> he said, "He said, well, how are you going to do this with this opera?" So he always talked about it in in that sense, you know. Uh, but the thing is, it's, it's you know. Um, Jazz gives you a lot of creative freeway mm-hmm. to think about motion picture in a different way, you know, in terms of structure. You know, I'm big on the three act structure, but I'm also big on breaking the three act structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Heidi Green calls it, what do you call the three act structure? The tyranny of the three act structure. <laughs> you know, but I'm big on three act structure, but you learn the three act structure so you can do other things. You can break away from it. So um, um, it gave me the possibility to try different things. Uh, just like in, in the music, sometimes you, you have a riff and never come back to it, but it works in the context of the whole piece, you know. Mm-hmm. So there are riffs or accent marks, you know, and some of it having to do with the civil rights movement, some of it having to do with the uh, uh, national liberation movements in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea Bissau, you know. Uh, some of it's just personal, you know. Um, and uh, uh, so that, uh, yeah, so it's, it's sort of structured, uh, in my mind at least, uh, like music and musician <laughs> might disagree with me, but in my mind, it was kind of like, like music, yeah. Well, there's so many different elements in the film. I mean, I think you could, you could it straddles like a lot of territory in terms of like it's an art film there's some experimental sequences there's documentary f- footage there's a, a very you know there's elements of genre the action genre in the film as well um so there's a lot of different elements at play and one of the things i'm always so struck by when i watch it is how moving through all of that very grounded in a kind of material critique of like power structures and and um, economics of the music industry but also locally there's a there's a there's a undercurrent of 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 the immaterial of the spiritual that kind of crescendos at, at the end I think which is really quite extraordinary the way that builds through the film can you mm-hmm. can you talk about how the interplay between the material and the immaterial the spiritual and the yeah the ecclesiastic elements and the secular elements yeah, yeah. Uh, that just seemed right, you know. I'm not particularly a religious person, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother used to always call me a heathen because <laughs> she's very religious. So, boy, you're just a heathen. <laughs> but uh, it just all made sense, you know, because um, there is a spiritual world, you know, that we really can't understand. You know, every preachers say they understand it, but no one really understands that the spiritual world, you just have to kind of let it happen, you know, and embrace it, you know, and uh, let it take you wherever it's going to take you. And But you'd said in an interview once that, I mean, they're not, there's no, there's like one specific reference to a Yoruban deity yeah. ocean at the end, but yeah. you had also talked to the characters about maybe their, you know, the actors about their characters yeah. being sort of related to specific deities. Usually if there's someone in the audience from Brazil, they get it right away. <laughs> uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's the character Oshun, who's a deity, you know. Um, uh, the old man I saw as uh, Shango, Warmak I saw as Ogun, uh, my uh, so as Yemen, you know, and nobody needs to know that, you know, but it just 
kind of made it make sense for me. Right. And the actors knew it too, although it, it never was uh, um, said or, you know, because um, we had we did some work, acting workshops before, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of it was transitioning people from theater to film, you know, acting for film. And uh, these, these things were brought up in terms of character, mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, subtext, was not even subtext because you're not going to pick it up. It's, it was just for us, right. you know, right. that we used it, you know, and if uh, the only clue is the character Oshun, you know, right. but uh, other than that, it was something that we used. One more question, I'm going to turn it over to the audience. There's a, I just want to mention this because there's a specific shot in the film. It's early on um, when Wormack is on the, on the beach and um, he's going through a sort of series of reveries and sort of crescendo in this wave shot. There's a wave sort of, I mean, it's a really striking image of this sort of crashing wave. But that shot has a particular story where you found that shot. Is that? Yeah, I, I went to the beach. Every time there was a big storm, I would go out to gra grab my camera and go out to... Uh, uh, Santa Monica Pier, mm -hmm. standing on the end and hope a big wave would <laughs> come in. And, and these big waves would come in, but they would peter out by the time they got to the pier, and I was just wasted time. So uh, I had to uh, go to a film library in town. I was looking for something. And um, at the end of the day, um, uh, the, the person that was in, in in, in the in, in the film library, he said, well, uh, is there anything else you, you might want? I said, well, you know, I've been trying to get a big wave, you know, and and, and I've been sh trying to shoot one. I just haven't been able to get a, a humongous wave, I think it was what I said. And she said, oh, wait, son, just a minute. <laughs> so she went back in the back, and she came back and with that big wave, you know. And what it is is actually an outtake. It's a shot that they didn't use in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so I so I bought it. <laughs> I love it that there's a little bit of epic Hollywood history like yeah. <laughs> planted into this radical film. So let's turn it over to the audience. Raise your hand and we'll bring a mic to you over here on this side right on the aisle. Um thank you. There's so the film is so rich with so many things. I love the beginning uh, with all the layers of the piano hand and um, all the different things that were overlay. And uh, there's a lot of red uh, coloring in there. And I I'm very taken with your um, sense of color. And I and I see it in your painting too. In fact, when they were, you know, putting it up at the beginning, I was like, "Who is this artist? This artist is fantastic. I've got to make sure that I ask, you know, the person who uh, sets up the. I know exactly <laughs> who sets this up. Who this artist is. Um, so your sense of color is amazing. And I'd, I'd like selfishly, I'd like to know: Is any of your artwork in print or? Can people get any of that? Yeah, I have a website. It's called LarryClarkPainter.com. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I, w when I was a, just a little guy, I was always uh, uh, enamored with cubism, you know. Um, and I think I was enamored with cubism because I was also enamored with bugs and, and things that crawled around that hid <laughs> and camouflaged themselves. And I would, as a kid, I would watch to find the bug in the bushes. You know, there's always something that gave it away, you know. And so with cubism also, it's like there's there's something there and you have to really look to see it, you know. And so I, as a kid, so this that beginning is sort of uh, what Alessandro Raggio calls soft edge cubism, which it, it really is, it's sort of soft edge cubism. You know, and I use a lot of primary colors. And, and by the way, there's a lot of stuff there that I didn't put there. Um, um, in other words, uh, with this, with the picture and the sound, for this, the sound for first, especially under the pier, mm -hmm. under the pier, I I laid out those tracks, each echo, I did I did my, my editing, and laid out those tracks, each overlapping uh, uh, piece of music, and then when we mixed it, those that sound overlap and set up a harmonic. And there was sound there that I didn't put there, but the the but the, the, the the music the, the the track put some of that sound there. It's the same with uh, the 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 images. Um, 
for this film, I used Fuji film. I was the first person to use 16 millimeter Fuji film in this country. Uh, I was leaving CFI and I saw some, some Japanese guys uh, um, by, by a storefront and they had a big sign that said Fuji film. So I, I went over and introduced myself, you know, Kanbawa, you know, Kagadeska, <laughs> Genki Des, you know. <laughs> and so they gave me all this film uh, for free uh, that I could do experiments with. But you couldn't buy Fuji film in this in the country at that time. So they shipped all of my uh, film directly from Japan. It came in these big, gigantic rolls, and I had to break it down. So um, uh, myself, Roderick Young, Julie Dash, and a kid named Ricky mentioned we did all these tests with this 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 footage to see what it would do. And it, so it was, it was reversal film. The the so the, the upside is reversal is actually. Uh, Fuji is very nice and beautiful. It archives really well, you know, and also it left, uh, I, I, I composed the, each instrument where it would leave a lot of black somewhere, and that was kind of like a mat, so the next image would come in fairly clean. So it was just orchestrating the composition, the color, uh, and, and uh, uh, um, the idea of sort of a cubist kind of effect, you know, uh, to get that. Another question from the audience. Let's go right in the middle here in this right here. Hi. Um, it, it's, on the, it's on the same color tip. Um, like from the beginning, you had a bunch of uh, red and blues. Um, and you seem to, like, it ends with, like, the similar, similar, like, color way, at least with, like, the red background and everything. But throughout the whole film, um, it seems like you're like you lean towards those um, colors a lot, but you know I don't. I just on the same question on the color, like if there was anything specific as to like why you like. It's just how you that. feel, you know. It's just it's art. It's just like how you feel. I, I particularly like primary colors because they pop, you know. Uh, whereas the the, the complementary colors they, they 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 give you something different. I mean, um, and uh, so yeah, it, it, it's just. A matter of choice, you know. Really, it's like, do, do you, does it please you? You know, does it please me? You know, and and that's what you know because if you're making a film. If it doesn't please you, then why bother? You know, I mean, even though some of it doesn't please you, you know, sometimes you hit, sometimes you miss, you know, but the the, the it, it it just felt right, you know, to me. A question from the audience. Let's come down here in the front row here. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I was really curious about um, kind of the local sort of LA jazz scene and mm -hmm. um, how you know you were participating in that, pulling from that, and then also um, just sort of today, like do you still kind of participate in the jazz scene today and where do you see that going? Um, well, when I finished this film, I had OD'd on jazz. <laughs> and for a couple of years, I didn't even listen to jazz. <laughs> and finally, I got over it. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I'd listened to a lot of music before. You know, my father had a really nice album collection. You know, and and a lot of the the, the impetus for the visuals come from album covers, front and back. You know, uh, just made sense. You know, uh, but uh, yeah, so. Um, yeah. Another question, let's go, um, how about right over here on this side over here? Yeah. Thanks again for sharing this film. Uh, I was curious about the uh, decision with that rolling, haunting piano track. It comes on during the scene with the cards, it comes on again uh, when he has his sort of solo at the end. And during the credits, what kind of brought, what was the idea there? What kind of you chose to move with that track? It just felt right. You know, it just felt right. And, it, it, you know, you, I, I think you just have to go with what you, 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 what you feel is right, you know, mm -hmm. not what people tell you, you know. Uh, you try out different things. You know, you try out different things, and uh, then what seems to work, and you you hope it works for other people. You know, you don't want to 
get too much into it that this works for me and so what, but you gotta also anticipate how it will be received too by other people because ultimately the film is made for someone else, it's not made for me. But as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artist, you also have to, to find some pleasure in what you're doing. There's a number of recurring motifs in the film and imagery of water imagery recur recurs a lot and the earth, you know, recur recur comes back a lot. Um, were those things that emerged over the course of, you know, I mean, how did those sort of recurring elements come into the into the work? It probably was in the script, you know, yeah. but it's for mood. For mood. Um, and in one case uh, uh, where they're in the car and the windshield wipers going back and forth, in 16 millimeter, you, you in 35 millimeter, you can sync up projector and um, um, because you have equipment to do. But I'm talking about back then. I'm not talking about now. Right. I'm talking about in the 70s. But 16 millimeter, you couldn't sync that up, and so you couldn't sync up the projector with the sound with the picture. They didn't have they didn't have the the the, the physical things the equipment that you could do that with in 16, you could in 35. So we had to figure out how to do that. And so, and the water played, played a part in this, in that um, the, obviously there's a sink pulse that comes into every building, 60 cycles. And so that was our sink pulse, the, the, just the, the, the electrical pulse that comes into the building. So the um, uh, recorder runs at 60 cycles uh, the projector runs at 60 cycles. We got an electric motor for the camera, and so now the camera was running at 60 cycles. So then we queued everything up, and uh, we had that uh, the, the 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 car, and then we had the, the street behind it. I anticipate that at some point that 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 60 cycles is only going to last for about a, maybe a minute and a half or two minutes at most. So when you have an effect then the next thing to do is you have to figure out how to hide it because something's always going to go wrong. And, and, and as the sync pulse, you lose the sync pulse, the projector starts pulsating. All right, so it looks really fake. So to hide it, I had the windshield wipers going back and forth from water hitting the windshield so that your eye is in the front as opposed to the back going out the window. So we hit the, because after a while the, 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 we did lose sync pulse on the projector. And if you ever see it again, you'll see where it's, it's, it's pulsating a little bit. But because we have the windshield wipers going back and forth, it's like a magician. You know, <laughs> A magician will be doing something with this hand and doing something with the other hand. You know, And so you need a distraction. So the rain was a distraction. The windshield wipers was a distraction so that you wouldn't look at the projector that was sort of fading out of sync in the background. Time for a couple more questions. Let's go um, way in the back. Right right there, yeah. Right no, behind you in the back. It, yeah. Gentlemen right there. Um, so the, the film is like literally embedded with political struggle um, and there's like the main narrative of the film is a political struggle and like the afterlife of the film, like it, there's specifically political decisions in terms of where you went um, in terms of going to Moscow or in terms of going to Africa for African film festivals, for like African political filmmaking struggle going forward. And so I was like, I'm really curious like how you felt then and how you feel now about the role of the artist in political struggle because it seems really important both in the film but also in terms of your sort of career as well, an artist. Well, everybody has to make their own choice in terms of what path they follow. But art has always been political. You know, and sometimes people say, oh, I want to be apolitical, but apolitical is still political in a negative sense, you know, because art, film, they propagate something. You know, it's propaganda, it propagates something. And this question is, what does it propagate? You know, it propagates ideas, you know, propagates uh, uh, information, you know. Uh, so I didn't see a distinction between the art and the political and myself. You know, they all kind of are one thing, I think. We have time for one more question. Let's go over here on this side. Uh, 
Um, yeah, you made various references to um, parallels between the musical components of the film and other structural elements, um, the film as composition. And I was wondering if the methodology of improvisation used for the music came in in other elements of the construction of the film in any way. Yeah. And if so, if there were moments um, that you would um, say were surprised you and you decided to um, yeah. work with. There was a lot of improvisation in the, in the film itself. Uh, in fact, one sequence is designed for improvisation, and that's the the scene where they're having this, the couple are having a, a, a tough time, you know. Uh, that scene, I wrote it, and then I put behind it times two. So we shot the same film, same scene four times, differently. And, and, and there's, and it, 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 the idea is that in a relationship, you might have an issue, a problem, and you hash it out and and you resolve it. You think, <laughs> and then you come back to that same issue again, you know, and you try to resolve it, and and, and it's on a different level, and, and 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 then a couple months later, you're back at that same issue, you know, and and for the, them, the issue was that he, she had taken some steps that, some steps of independence that he was having a hard time. Doing, she said she quit the agency, you know, and 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 so um, that sort of that's the underlying problem there because she's done something that he should have done, you know. She's taken the lead, and guys, we have a hard time following women. We should, <laughs> and so that's what that. So there's a lot of improvisation there, you know, um, and uh, yeah. So there's. It, I, you know, I, I, again, I said it was sort of stream of consciousness. So there's improvisation for the whole, the whole film too. You know, uh, I had a screenplay, but the screenplay was kind of like the guide, you know, um, to to keep the bottom from falling out. And so, but, but in the in the in the acting, um, um, in the camera work, uh, uh, it, you have to have a to to do improvisation. You still have to have a structure. Otherwise, the proposition is going to go off the rails. It's not going to make any sense. You know, have the structure so that that allows you to uh, to, to to have improvisation. You know, even with the music, the music has a head that's very, and then it, they, the musicians go off, and then they come back to the tail. You know, so there's some structure there. It's just not something wild. You know, so it's sort of a structured improvisation throughout the whole film. Thank you. Well, Larry will be with us tomorrow night for after As Above, So Below, along with some short films, and then on Sunday uh, for Cutting Horse. So please come back. Larry, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. It's really amazing. <laughs> <laughs>